My name is Jacob Alder. Uh, I'm an ERAL alumni, aerospace engineer, and I work on data analysis. My name is Dahlia Bridges. I'm a 2015 aerospace engineering graduate from here, and I am a testing and evaluation engineer. Morning, I'm Scott Blue, um, retired Air Force, and 35 years working in military space programs. And so today, I have these days, I work as a consultant the same kind of space programs. Very nice to be here. And with that, uh, I'll pass it on to Michelle Machado, our project manager this semester, who will be starting our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Benavides. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michelle Machado. I'm the project manager for Phoenix Air Just Launch Systems. This is our preliminary design review for the, our project legacy. In overview this morning, we talked about the introduction of our project, the mission concept, the system definition, trajectory, the structure subsystem, the payload and electronic subsystem, the recovery subsystem, and finally management. Our project is divided into three subsystems, as you can see, structures, payload electronics, and recovery. Each subsystem has a team lead who reports directly to the project manager myself and has a list of following team members with them. Communicating between the subsystems are three integrators who report directly to the system project manager, who also reports to the project manager. The system project manager for our team is David gomez Herrera. The goal of our project is to provide the customer with, the, uh, with a viable launch system that could potentially replace the current balloon launch system used at the Experimental Space Systems class at Invermont Aeronautical University, Prescott, Arizona. Phoenix Aerospace Launch System's alternative launch system is a high-powered rocket called Legacy. As you can see here is our mock-up of our cut the cutaway view of our mock-up for our Legacy and a 3D Katia model of Legacy here. The, the project has seven mission objectives. The first two is Legacy should reach an apoapsis greater than 9,000 meters respect to the launch pad and less than 13,000 meters. Legacy should return to Earth using a parachute. Legacy should transport six scientific payloads. The total scientific payload mass should be less than 10 kilograms. Legacy should withstand more than one flight, and Legacy should use a commercially available motor. The launch site that we will be testing our rocket is in Aguila, Arizona. It is approximately two hours southwest of Prescott. It is called Eagle Eye Launch Site. It is a certified Triple E Rocketry Association launch site. The day of launch site of excuse me, the day of launch, which will be April 16, 2016, we will be testing our rocket for our system. Here's a concept of operations for Legacy. At time zero, Legacy will launch. At 6.32 seconds, the motor will burn out. At 47 seconds, the nose cone will eject. At 48 seconds, Legacy will reach apoapsis, and at this time, the parachute will deploy out, pulling this, the payloads out and making its descent. During its descent, the payloads will be collecting scientific data, and after 22 minutes, after reaching apoapsis, Legacy will return to Earth using a parachute. And now we pass it on to David gomez Herrera, our system project manager, who will be discussing the system definition. Thank you very much, Michelle. As you said, my name is David gomez Herrera, and now we're talking about system definition. Uh, system definition relies over the integration team, which consists of myself, Sage Bauer, Anu de la Rosa, and Cal Hosman. Uh, as a team, we're in charge of uh, verifying and validating the system level requirements for this mission, which are the following listed here. Um, the first two describe the minimum and maximum range for our apoapsis altitude, which is between 9 kilometers and 13 kilometers. Legacy shall also transport six scientific payloads, and the total mass of those scientific payloads shall be less than 10 kilograms. 
uh, legacy structures should be able to withstand more than one flight, and the total impulse used by the motor shall not exceed 4,960 newton seconds. This is because of um, safety regulations. We also have development and implementation requirements, which are mostly the uh, monetary cost ones. We had a development requirement for a max cost of shall be less than $2,600, and implementation, which is after development cost, shall be less than a thousand US dollars. Here we have the current design for legacy, as we can see on the diagram and also on our mockup. We have a total. Uh, we're using a Cicerone O3 1400 motor, and the total length of our rocket is 2.31 meters, with a mass of 28.78 kilograms. Um, then we have the center of pressure and center of gravity, as we can see on the diagram, located center of pressure 89.24 along the z-axis, which starts zero at the nozzle, and then center of gravity at 102.6, um, also in the z-axis. We can see the x and y axis uh, center of gravity directions are close to zero. This for uh, this how it should be for stability purposes. Here we have a, a diagram um, showing the inside or part of the inside of our rocket. In order to validate and verify our requirements, we broke the system into three subsystems, which are structures, payloads and electronics, and recovery. Recovery subsystem is located right below the nose cone, as we can see on the diagram, but also on our mock-up. After that, right below, we have payloads and electronics section, and then the structure subsystem is distributed all along the rocket. Our structure subsystem is in charge of designing uh, structure aerodynamically and also as with low weight as possible so we can reach our altitude, um, above altitude limits, but also it should be strong enough so we can withstand more than one flight. Payloads and electronics are in charge of um, designing the amount of payloads required and also gathering the scientific data for the experimental space systems class to use. Um, electronics also in charge of the telemetry of the <coughs> rocket. And finally, recovery is there to guarantee that the um, structure will withstand more than one flight. This is a little bit more characteristics of our current motor. It's a reloadable motor, that way we can reuse it after more than one flight. Uh, it has a 9.2 centimeter diameter with a length of 1.24 meters. A total mass is 16.84 kilograms and total impulse is 21,062 newton seconds. The board time is 6.2 seconds and an ISP of 197 seconds. Here's the current mass budget for Legacy. We have structure subsystems with 2.57 kilograms, payloads and electronics 5.78 kilograms, recovery 1.32, and then the other components of the rocket besides the subsystem have the empty motor casing 5.91 kilograms, and the propellant mass 10.93, giving us our previous weight for the total uh, mass of the rocket. Then we have extra mass of 2.27. This extra mass is located uh, inside the nose cone in order to shift our center of gravity higher than our center of pressure, giving us a final total mass of 28.78 kilograms, as shown before. Um, this is uh, the progress so far regarding our uh, mission requirements. The minimum apoplasm altitude is numerically validated. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this further on. Our current altitude is at 14.4 kilometers. Um, so our minimum requirement was 9 kilometers, so we could numerically validate it. Now, our maximum altitude was set up for 14 kilometers, so this number will still be pending because right now we're exceeding it. Um, number of scientific payloads, we designed for six payloads so far, so we can numerically validate it also. The weight of these payloads, as shown from our mass budget, is less than 10 kilograms. It was 5.39, so it's also numerically validated for the moment. Then the structure we're standing more than one flight is pending. There's no way we can test that um, besides actual testing. And then the total impulse is validated on paper according to the data provided by the manufacturer of the model. And I'll pass it into Carl Hosker, who will give more data about the trajectory. Thank you, David. As you said, my name is Kyle Hauser, and I'll be talking about the trajectory today. 
So the point of the trajectory is to have an accurate model of the entire flight you can see from takeoff to touchdown. Another reason is so our subsystems know when to deploy the parachute and what kind of forces may be acting on, upon the rocket during its entire flight. So to those forces, there are two points about the rocket where these forces act, the center of pressure and the center of gravity. To the center of pressure, you have the thrust and force due to the mass of the rocket acting. And to the center of pressure, you have the resultant drag force of the entire rocket's body acting. The, the equation we used to model our code was the equation of motion shown here, where T is thrust, D is drag, M is mass, and G is gravity. The software we used was MATLAB and OpenRocket. OpenRocket is a free program that anybody can download. All you have to do is build your rocket in the program, input the masses of each section, choose your material properties, hit simulate, and you can see how fast the rocket will go, how high it will go, what kind of drag force in my experience, and many more options. The only downfall with Open Rocket is over speeds of Mach 1, the drag coefficients start to get a little iffy and it becomes a little less accurate. Whereas with MATLAB, we can actually do our own research on other rockets similar to this, input that data into our own simulations and have a more accurate model. Here you can see two tables showing how MATLAB and Open Rocket differ. Both had uh, apoapsis of 14.44 kilometers for MATLAB, 14.48 kilometers for Open Rocket and both occurred at about 48 seconds. You can see how the other values for the events and times are also very similar, showing that both our data and OpenRocket's data are close. Here you can see a plot of our altitude over time. After burnout, the acceleration due to gravity only acts about right here, and it settles our rocket down to about 14.44 kilometers, as I said before. Now to speed, you can see according to OpenRocket, we reached about 831 meters per second, and MATLAB, 815 meters per second. Both at about 5.2, 5.3 seconds. Here's the inertial acceleration. Uh, we reached two, or, uh, sorry about that. We reached 20.71 Gs according to Open Rocket and 20.66 Gs according to MATLAB. Both occurring at 2.9, 2.8 seconds. Here's the mock over the entire flight with the apoapsis. Uh, we reached five or two points, sorry, 2.51 mock according to Open Rocket and 2.49 according to MATLAB at 5.2 and 5.4 seconds. Here's the drag force according to MATLAB and Open Rocket. So in MATLAB, we actually recorded a max drag force of 2,884 newtons, and in Open Rocket, it was about 990. And this is, we, we believe this is because our drag coefficients aren't correctly modeled right now in our MATLAB simulation code. So we just need to still work on that. And here's our drag coefficients versus mock. So as you can see, we modeled it just as an OJAD nose cone basically right now. This data is from a fluids book. And the red is the open rocket data, which they use. Here's the mass of legacy over the burn time. So it burns out 6.3 seconds and becomes constant. And as you can see, it's actually not a linear regression. It is, becomes nonlinear right in here. Here's the thrust curve according to open rocket and the one we used in MATLAB. The thrust curve we, we obtained, we got from thrustcurve.org. We implemented the data into our code, and you can see it here. And for future simulations, we'd like to model the drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number, because we are only above Mach for about two seconds, whereas our entire flight up to apoapsis is 48 seconds. So Reynolds number is actually more important, resulting to drag coefficient. Also, we'd like to implement attitude, so we know if we're exhibiting stable flight and unstable flight, depending on the positions of the CP according to the CG. And we'd also like to do a thermal analysis so that we can tell what temperatures the skin might be experiencing during the flight, since how we are approaching about 2.5 Mach, and so that we know the internal temperature for electronics and our payloads. Now I'd like to turn it over to Isaac Perry so he can talk about the structure subsystem. Uh, thank you, Kyle. As my colleague mentioned, my name is Isaac Perry, and I'm the team lead for the Structure Subsystem. Uh, presenting with me today will be Akash Joseph, a Structures team member. Uh, so for our Structure Subsystem requirement, we have that the structure shall transport more than one scientific payload. Uh, the structure shall accommodate uh, the solid rocket motor. I'm sorry, uh, the structure shall transport six scientific payloads. And uh, legacy shall reach an apoapsis greater than 9,000 meters. Legacy shall reach an apoapsis of less than 13,000 meters. 
and the structure shall withstand more than one flight. Here we have some concept art for the structure of legacy. At the top, you can see the nose cone. Beneath that, we have the payload section, which will encapsulate the scientific payloads as well as the recovery and electronic subsystems. Uh, below that, we have the motor section, which will accommodate the solid rocket motor. Uh, at the base, we have four fins, uh, which will be used to help stabilize the rocket during flight. Uh, we have three bulkheads, which are located at the uh, base of the motor section, directly above the motor casing, and directly beneath the scientific payloads. Uh, we also have five centering rings, which are located at increments of eight inches above the base of the motor section. Uh, here's a chart showing our material design decisions for the, for the structure subsystem. Uh, here we have our sections which show each individual component for the structure. The materials used, the product name, the length in inches, the thickness in inches, and the density in pounds mass per inch cube. Uh, for the nose cone, fiberglass was chosen. For the payload section, uh, fiberglass was also chosen. Fiberglass was chosen for the payload section because of its ease of fabrication and also because it will not block radio waves as with carbon fiber. Uh, carbon fiber was chosen for the motor section because it has similar strength properties to fiberglass. However, the density is around half that of fiberglass. Uh, for the centering rings, balsa wood was chosen for its low density and ease of fabrication. For the fins and rings, aluminum 6000 series was chosen. For the spars, aluminum 7000 series was chosen as the spars will be expected to carry loads from the dynamic pressure on top of the nose cone as well as the weight of the payloads. Uh, here we have a diagram describing an O-drive shape which we use for our nose cone. Uh, here we have some governing equations for that. The, for the caliber of the nose cone, we have L. For the height of the nose cone, it's shown as H. Uh, if you solve for the radius of the defining circles of that nose cone, uh, you will receive this equation here. Uh, for our nose cone, we have a fineness ratio of 1 to 1, which will give us a radius of de the defining circles of 6.29 inches. Uh, here we have a 3D rendering of the nose cone and a schematic view showing the caliber, the height, the external radius, and the internal radius. Uh, here we have a 3D rendering for the payload section, and uh, this is the third bulkhead located right here inside the structure. Here we have a cross-sectional view directly above that bulkhead, showing the uh, third bulkhead here, and also a detailed view showing the fiberglass skin, the aluminum spar, the aluminum ring, and the bulkhead located inside here. Uh, here we have a 3D rendering for the motor section, as well as a view without the skin, so you can see the centering rings inside, the bulkhead 1 at the base, bulkhead 2 located near the top, and the spars running along the length of the skin. Uh, here we have a cross-sectional view for the motor section, taken directly above the second bulkhead. You can see here the uh, carbon fiber skin on the outside, then the aluminum spars, then the aluminum ring, in the fiberglass bulkhead located here. Uh, here we have slots uh, cut into the top of the bulkhead, which will be for accessing the bolts that will attach it to the skin of the structure. Uh, here we have a more detailed view of that bulkhead showing a 3D rendering and a cross section halfway through where you can see the uh, fiberglass skin of the bulkhead on the outside and also on the inside with the balsa wood ribs running along its length internally. Uh, here we have a diagram showing the centering rings. Here's a 3D rendering as well as a cross-sectional view. Uh, here we have the, I'm sorry, this needs to be changed. These are the bolts which will be used for connecting the uh, bulkheads to the rocket as well as for connecting the fins to the skin of the motor section. Uh, here we have a chart showing the advantages and disadvantages of a three-fin design versus a four-fin design. Uh, we decided to go with a four-fin design as it will be easier to manufacture 
and there's less chance of compromising stability during flight. Here's a 3D rendering of the fins, as well as a cross-sectional view showing the root cord, the tip cord, the span, and the sweep angle for the fins. And uh, with that, uh, we would like to pass it on to Akash Joseph, who will be discussing results and analysis. Thank you, Isaac. As my colleague just mentioned, my name is Akash Joseph. I'll be talking about the structure analysis and results. To start off, we have the subsystem material fabrication methods. So for the composites, which is the carbon fiber and the fiberglass, we have used the wet layer process, the pre prep process, and the direct purchase. For the aluminum 6000 series, 7000 series, and for the balsa wood, we have a simple machining process. Um, alternative to that is also a direct purchase of custom parts. As you can see, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Here is the decision for the fabrication process. For the composites, we decided to go with the wet layer process, which is the most cost efficient process, costing about $100 approximately. And for the aluminum 6000 series and 7000 series, and for the balsa wood, we selected the simple machining process, which costs about $60. Here we have the subsystem mass calculations. So we have the components listed out, the millstone, the payload section, the motor section, and the fins, and their respective shapes and the masses. These masses have been deduced from the uh, from CATIA, which was given from integration, and also validated by the structure subsystem team from hand calculations. The total structure mass is about 7.18 pounds. Here we have the subsystem pricing specifications um, for the materials. Uh, we have the materials listed, the product name, thickness and inches, and the cost per section. The carbon fiber, which is used for the skin on the motor section, the fiberglass, which is used for the skin on the payload section, the bulkheads, and the nose stone, the 7000 series aluminum, which is used for the spars that run across the entire length of legacy, the 6000 series uh, aluminum, which is used for the fins and the aluminum rings, and the balsa wood, which is used for the centering rings. The total subsystem cost is $196.21. Here we have some hand calculations uh, performed by the structure subsystem team. We did uh, stress analysis and buckling analysis. For stress analysis, we did a compressive stress analysis, and this is the governing equation for that. Uh, for the buckling analysis, we used a fixed free support model for column buckling, um, and here's the governing equation. For the results for the compressive stress, we have a table with the sections listed, the compressive stresses, which was deduced from the governing equations, and the subsections, and the factors of safety. As you can see here, the lowest factor of safety is for the spars and the motor section. Um, and from these factors of safety, it looks like the structure, structure subsystem has been uh, over-designed. However, if we move forward into the buckling analysis, you can see that the factors of safety have reduced significantly. If, the, if all the loads were to be carried by the spars, uh, the factor of safety would be 2.0. However, this is unrealistic. Uh, so we combined critical loading for the skin and the spars, and we attained a factor of safety of 6.0. Uh, at this time, it is uncertain how the load transfers between the skin and the spars, so this result is not 100% accurate. For the requirement numerical validation status, for the first requirement, we applied uh, design parameters to CATIA and Open Rocket where the internal diameter of the skin was equal to the external diameter of the payloads. For the second requirement, uh, the, we applied the design parameters to CATIA and Open Rocket, where the internal diameter of the centering ring was equal to the external diameter of the uh, motor casing. For the altitude requirements, we applied the design parameters to Open Rocket, uh, where we optimized for the fins and the nose cone, and uh, we atta attained an altitude of greater than 9,000 meters. However, for the uh, 13,000 meter requirement, the uh, numerical validation is pending because of the altitude we received was greater than 13,000 meters. And finally, for the last requirement, we performed hand calculations as we've seen in the previous slides. For future simulation improvements, we will perform ANSYS dynamic analysis, ANSYS thermal analysis, some fatigue analysis, vibration analysis, and wind tunnel testing to validate the designs for the nose cone and the fins. With that, I pass it off to Jonathan Winters. We'll talk about the payload and electronic subsystem. Thank you, Josh. As my colleague mentioned, my name is Jonathan Winters. I'm the payload and electronics subsystem team lead. I'll be talking about our design. The other members of my team are Clark Anderson, 
Michael Blair, Christopher Ricario, and Jaron Long. The payload and electronic subsystem is divided into two main sections, which are the electronics and the payloads. The electronics bay is here. Its primary purposes are to record and send GPS data to the ground station, as well as to deploy the recovery system. We have six different scientific payloads, which constitute the payload system, payload section. These will be used by students in experimental space systems to gather scientific data. The first one of these payloads is an octagon. Here is a visual overview of the payload and electronic subsystem after it has left the rocket. With the parachute on this side, the electronics bay, the octagonal payload, the five cylindrical payloads, and the rest of the rocket structure on that side. Here is a visual overview of the exterior of the electronics bay. It has a fiberglass skin, two wooden bulkheads, and two metal bolts. Here is a GM model of the interior of the electronics bay, which will look something like this. The components of it include a primary microcontroller, which is the TI launchpad and sensor of, a redundant microcontroller, two battery packs, one 9 volt and one set of four AA's to power those two systems, a GPS data or a GPS system, and a radio to find the locations to find the rocket after it lands. This radio operates on the 915 megahertz ISM band. That is important because. As long as you use it for industrial, scientific, or medical purposes, you can use it without a license, which will make it easier for the students in experimental space systems to use it. Finally, we have a power board, which includes a voltage regulator and two MOSFET circuits. This will not be in a breadboard in the final design. Next, we have six different scientific payloads. This is in order to, we have six different options in order to have the possibility of having six different teams of experimental space systems. If there are less people than six teams, then we can remove instruments from the payloads to have and ballast it to have the correct weight. The first of these payloads is a sun sensor payload. It is an octagon in order to have six orthogonal, orthogonal sides to get a good sun vector. It has the same TI launch pad and sensor up as the electronics bay, a sun sensor payload, a battery and voltage regulator behind the sun sensor payload, and the six sun sensors as shown here. Next payload is a camera payload. There will be two of these. One will be programmed to record still images. The other will be programmed to record video. It has a mini spy pan camera, which we're using because it is very space, cost, and weight efficient. It also has the same microcontroller, the AA battery, and the voltage regulator. In addition, all these payloads have a foam ring on the top of it, with the, which will be where, where the tether connecting all of them will be coiled while it is in the rocket. The next payload is an infrared or IR sensor with the same microcontroller, same battery, same voltage regulator, and an infrared sensor. The next payload is a thermistor payload. We have a thermistor payload in order to get an accurate thermal model throughout the payload. This has six different thermistors throughout the payload as well as a board for it, and the same microcontroller, same voltage regulator, and same battery. The final payload is an ultraviolet or UV sensor with the UV sensor here and the same components as the rest of the payloads. Next, I'll be talking about the design metrics used to come up with this design. For all components, we analyze the cost, volume, and mass, as well as the voltage and current. The voltage is of particular importance because we want a microprocessor that works at the same output voltage as all the instrumentation's input voltage. Next, we have design metrics for only the power components, which include battery life and operating temperature. These were satisfied on paper, the battery life was satisfied on paper through a MATLAB power budget, and the operating temperature is still pending based on a thermal analysis. Next, we have design metrics for communication components only. These include receive sensitivity and output power, which are the main numerical components for how far a signal will travel, and these were validated on paper with a MATLAB for the budget. Finally, we have design metrics for structural components only, which include ultimate tensile strength, ultimate compressor strength, and ultimate shear strength. These were analyzed on paper with an ANSYS model, and the ultimate tensile strength of the tether connecting the payloads together was analyzed through its product specifications. Next, we will pass it on to Clark Anderson, who will be talking about the specific devices chosen as a result of these design metrics. Thank you, John. As I said, my name is Clark Anderson, and I'll be talking some more about the payload electronic subsystem. First, we're going to talk. First, we're going to talk about the 
CIO Launchpad and Sensor Hub. CIO Launchpad is, satisfies the requirements of recording measured data and transmitting signals to the recovery subsystem and provide it, and transmitting the GPS position data to the radio. It operates on a 5 volt input and outputs 3.3 volts to each of the sensors on the sensor hub and the additional sensors that we will be adding. The sensor hub has sensors including accelerometers, ray gyroscopes, temperature and pressure sensors, as well as others. There are two, uh, two battery pack types on the unit payload and electronic subsystem. The, there is a 4 AA battery pack and one 9 volt. The 4 AA battery pack will be placed in every uh, payload and the electronics bay, and one 9 volt battery will be placed in the electronics bay. The 4 AA battery pack is there to provide 6 volts to the uh, TI launch pad and provide more than 5,000 milliamp hours to each of the payloads. The 9 volt battery is there to provide 9 volts to the micro timer, which will provide redundant signals to the uh, recovery subsystem. Next is the GPS device we've chosen. It operates at 3.3 volts via UART and satisfies the requirements of measuring the maximum apoapsis altitude and determining the landing location of legacy upon completion of its flight. Next is the 3DR radio set. It satisfies the requirements of outputting the GPS data to a ground station via the 915 MHz SM band. It has a sensitivity of minus 117 decibels and an output power of 250 milliwatts. The next is the microphone 2. This is for providing redundant signals to the recovery subsystem at 45 and 46 seconds of after launch. The, it operates on 9 volts. Next is the sun sensor. There, here is a blown up picture of one of our sun sensors. There are six of them on six orthogonal sides of the sun sensor payload. The sun sensor payload is the octagonal one here. This sensor and the next three sensors all operate on 3.3 volts via I2C and uh, satisfy the requirements of measuring recorded data and providing multiple payload configurations. Next is the infrared phototransistor. It will be placed in an in infrared payload. The UV sensor, which will be placed in the ultraviolet payload. And six thermistors, which will be placed in the thermistor payload. Next is the mini spy pen camera. It will, there will be two of these, one placed in each of these payloads here. The, if one will be a program to record video and the other to record still images. It satisfies the requirements of providing recording images and providing multiple payload configurations. The next component is the P-channel MOSFET circuit. The TI launchpad can, it does not have the capability to output enough current for the recovery to activate the recovery subsystem. Therefore, we've inserted the P-channel MOSFET circuit between the TI launch pad and the recovery subsystem to increase its output current to one amp, which is enough to activate the recovery subsystem. The next component is the voltage regulator. As I stated earlier, the 4AA battery pack provides six volts, the, and the TI launch pad requires a five volt input. Therefore, we're putting the voltage regulator between them to convert the voltage. It, this model was chosen because it has a low voltage dropout feature. There are two structure types for the payload the, and electronics subsystem. There is the octagonal and the cylindrical. They're both constructed out of fiberglass uh, with top, surface, top and bottom surfaces of 1.5 millimeters thick and vertical surfaces of 0.7 millimeters thick. Next is the electronics bay. It will be constructed out of two plywood bulkheads on top and bottom and a fiberglass skin and two bolts that will run the length to support the electronics within and to hold the payload together. This structure and the previous two structures are just designed to withstand the 315, the expected 315 Newton opening force. This is a list of the requir our requirements and our analysis method. 
The first three are pending numerical validation upon a completion of a thermal analysis to determine if our batteries will operate at the expected temperatures that legacy will see. The fourth requirement is pending upon a physical testing of the, whether or not the tether will be torn out of the top and bottom surfaces of the payloads and electronics bay. We do not have an accurate way to numerically model that. And the last uh, requirement there is been validated via MATLAB link budget. These, these requirements are pending a uh, because the excuse me the we have we only have the products spec sheets and data sheets to, to determine whether or not they satisfy the requirements. We do not have any numerical values to work with. The, yeah. And then for future work and improvements, the, we would like to do a dynamic structural analysis on the payloads and electronic bay. The, and we would like to do a thermal analysis to determine how its insulation will be required to uh, make sure that all of our components operate through the flight. And we would like to create a detailed link budget. Now I'll pass it on to Josco Ferrio to discuss the recovery subsystem. Thank you, Clark. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Jose Carrillo, and I'm the recovery subsystem team leader. Uh, also on the recovery team is Leila Shams and Benjamin Risto. This is a visual overview of the recovery subsystem. It is located at the top of the rocket. Underneath the nose cone, we have our ejection charge. Uh, we have wadding under that to protect the parachute from the ignition of the charge. And underneath our parachute, we have a spring deployment system. Uh, the ejection charge is, uh, will be inside of the ejection charge canister. Uh, there will be black powder inside the canister and an e-match connected to the electronic subsystem that will ignite the black powder when we receive the signal. For the parachute, uh, we decided to go with the cross canopy shape. Uh, figure 8.3 shows the cross canopy if it were laid flat on the ground. And figure 8.4 is uh, concept art of the parachute fully open. We were looking at vendors and we found that one of, one of the, excuse me, the, the vendor we are purchasing the parachute from has a slight variation on the cross uh, canopy where it comes to a point at the end. The design metrics considered for the parachute were the canopy diameter, the opening force, the angle of oscillation, and the cost implementation. We performed a uh, different analysis for, to figure out the diameter of uh, the parachute that we, Legacy would require. We used uh, different specifications from different canopy shapes, and we used the vendor information available on the vendor websites. We also uh, relied a lot on the Parachute Recovery Systems Design Manual by T.W. Mack that provided us with some of our equations. For the packing method, we considered damage probability, packing density, and cost. Uh, once again, we used product specifications and we ran some calculations to figure out the volume that we would require inside legacy. Our spring ejection system is composed of a spring compressed between two pieces of plywood and um, my teammate Layla will give a little more information on that. For the ejection system, we considered reliability, cost implementation, and reusability. We looked at other projects to see what kind of systems they had to eject the parachute. We looked at product pricing for the different components of the ejection system, and we performed some calculations to um, ensure that the spring was had a high enough spring constant that will deploy the parachute. Now I would like to hand it off to Leila Shams, who will continue talking about the resulting analysis of the recovery subsystem. Thank you, Hoska. As she said, my name is Leila Shams, and I will be continuing the discussion of the recovery subsystem. 
The recovery subsystem has three requirements. Firstly, the nose cone shall eject within four seconds before apoapsis. The parachute deployment system shall deploy within one second after nose cone ejection. And finally, the parachute component of the recovery subsystem shall slow the descent of legacy to a speed of less than 25 feet per second. The first component of the recovery subsystem is the ejection charge, as modeled here, right under the nose cone and under the and above the wadding. These are the equations that we use to size the ejection charge. The first is the pressure that is needed to be built up in order to eject the nose cone. The second is the volume in which the ejection charge will be placed. And once these two values are found, they are plugged into this equation here, which utilizing these conversion factors, we find a mass of black powder that is needed for the ejection charge in grams. Currently, the ejection charge is still in the design process. We, it requires further testing in order to validate the nose cone requirement. We also require further testing in order to determine the time in the time it will take for the ejection charge to eject the nose cone, as well as the amount of wadding needed, as the ejection charge is a very delicate system in that too much black powder with too little wadding can cause damage to the structure and the parachute. Too little will not eject the nose cone. In either case, this will result in mission failure. We use two methods to size the parachute, the first of which numerically validates the descent rate requirement utilizing this equation here, as well as these values given, provided by the Rocketman parachute website. The diameter of each parachute, the descent rate, as well as its associated payload weight, were plugged into this equation here to find the drag coefficient of each parachute. We, once we found that drag coefficient, we plugged it in, we plugged that value, as well as the diameter of the parachute and the weight of our payload at burnout to find the descent rate for each parachute. Currently, we have, this method tells us that an eight foot diameter parachute would be necessary as this is the smallest diameter parachute that still validates our requirement. The second method we used utilized a MATLAB, MATLAB code, excuse me, that numerically integrated the acceleration. This code provided us with a parachute that, of 10 feet in diameter this parachute would give us a descent rate of 23.6 feet per second of it as descent rate, excuse me. Due to the discrepancy between these two methods, we do need physical testing in order to determine the proper parachute to use for this, for the mission. Here's the spring system. There is the compressed spring system as modeled here in the mock-up and also here in its uncompressed form. The spring is made up of two plywood boards, here and here, modeled here and here, as, uh, and the spring is a spring available on campus in Axfab. The spring will be held in compression via nylon, nylon cord connected from this hook here to this hook here and drawstringed through the bottom, through the bottom plywood board. The, around the nylon cord will be a nichrome wire. This wire will be connected to the electronic subsystem, which will send a current through the core, through the through the nichrome wire when apoapsis is reached, and that current will melt the nylon cord, thus releasing the system from its compressed state to its uncompressed state and ejecting the parachute. As you can see here, these are requirement validations. The first two requirements still require further testing and have not been numerically validated on paper as of yet. The final requirement has been numerically validated on paper utilizing MATLAB, equations from the parachute design manual, as well as hand calculations. And now I would like to hand it over to Michelle Machado who will conclude our presentation with management. Thank you, Lilia. In conclusion, I'll be talking about the management part of this project. Our team was given a fictitious labor budget of $500,000. It is broken down to these following categories. Management is any work done by myself, the project manager, outside of class. Engineering is any outside work outside of class done with technical or research done. 
Technicals, any fabrications into the project, for example, creating our mock-up, and for next semester, creating our actual rocket. Professional development is any class time we have, so typically we have per week three classes lasting two hours long. Administrative is any work done outside of class regarding any documents or presentation preparation, and holidays, any work done during a school holiday. Here's a pie chart of the total of each category, and here's the total cost for up till yesterday for the semester, and the total hours. This is our project budget for Legacy. As you can see, the homeowner costs $1,200. Integration has $100. Recovery has $400. Hale Electronics has $500. Structures has $200. Our rainy day fund is $200. Our rainy day fund is money we set aside for unforeseen costs in the future for our project. Total budget will be adding up to $2,600. This is the preliminary design milestones we have been given by Dr. Benavides. As you can see, we have completed the following milestones, and we are currently right now at the last milestone for a preliminary design review. This is one of two um, tables for our detailed semester milestones. And you can see here for the second chart, our launch date for Legacy will be April 16, 2016. We've learned a lot about communication and teamwork, given that we're a team of 15 people, it is important to make sure we're constantly talking with each other, making sure we're all on the same page in order to actually complete our project and have a successful mission. We've learned to the importance of meeting deadlines on time, getting work done, especially before a big break such as Thanksgiving, and listening to team leads between subsystems. We'd like to thank Dr. Julio Benavides and Dr. Patrick McElwain for being our advisors for this project and we listed individuals and organizations for contributing to our project, and also thank you for the panelists for attending our presentation. This concludes our presentation. At this time, I would like to invite the rest of my team up to the front for any questions. First, want to start with saying congratulations. This is a very professionally done project. I'm very impressed. Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, uh, starting with uh, just the project description. Um, on slide nine, you were showing the overview of the rocket as it's going about its mission. Uh, my question is, why was the choice made to deploy the shoot before the apoapsis period? We want to deploy before apoapsis so that um, after apoapsis the parachute will begin to tumble, or the, sorry, legacy will begin to tumble, and we don't want that to interfere with the proper deployment of the parachute. Okay. Um, actually, while we're on the topic of the parachute, I have a few questions related to that. Um, my first one is on your requirements. Uh, you've stated that you will deploy the shoot system prior to, or uh, within one second of nose cone injection. I was just hoping that you could go into a little more detail about the recovery system because I'm trying to understand how it's actually functioning. So we want to deploy the nose cone one second, uh, or the parachute one second after the nose cone. Uh, this will allow for enough time for the nose cone to kind of move out of the way so the parachute doesn't get tangled up in it. Uh, one second uh, results in uh, about 20 meters in height difference. Well, the reason I'm asking is because I see that you have a, an injection spring positioned below the parachute, but then you have an injection charge above the parachute. I mean, that's the part I'm confused about. Right, so the injection charge is deploying the nose cone. Okay, I understand. Yes. Um, the next question is, uh, when you were doing your simulations for determining your parachute size and method. You did note that there was a discrepancy between the two methods of analysis and that you would need to test on that earlier to figure out uh, exactly which method is correct. My question then is, why do you think there was a discrepancy between the two methods? 
I believe that the discrepancy between the two methods is the area used, the projected area. So method one uses a circular projected area, and that's based on the equation. Um, it's an assumption that the design manual suggests. And then method two, uh, since we were looking at the parachute with the wedge-shaped area, uh, has a slightly different projected area, where we didn't assume circular, we assumed two ellipses. Okay, thank you. Um, and I believe my last question on the parachute is, when you were talking about how to compress the spring and load the cord on it, but my question is, is how are you going to tie up the cord once it's compressed? Because with the cord being compressed, I don't know how you're going to get uh, your fingers or tools between the coils and the spring. Um, so we're going to draw string <laughs> cord, and that's actually a very good question that I do not have an answer to. Okay, <laughs> thank you. It's just something to keep in mind. Yes. Um, my next question is for the trajectory team. On slide 22, you were discussing the equation we used to determine atmospheric forces, and you were saying that there was an issue using the open rocket regarding the coefficient of drag. Why do you think there's an issue regarding the coefficient of drag? I think it's just how they model it in their code. Uh, do you think they are accounting for the shock drags of the shock wave in Ancestor Mach 1? Uh, can you go to my acceleration plot, please? I'm not sure what slide that is. Thank you. 26 seconds? Actually, drag force kids, sorry. Should we do it? 20. Okay. So, do you see the first bump? Yeah, can I go this one, please? So, you see the first bump right here? That's actually where it breaks Mach 1 in their code. So, then all this is supersonic flight for them, and then right back here is where it drops back down into Mach 1. So, they do try to model some kind of shock wave. It's just so all the readings I've seen is they don't model very well in the program. So okay. uh, that might be something just worth investigating to figure out where the discrepancy is, just so you don't necessarily do it by accident. Right. Just something to get in mind. That was something else we also wanted to do with the nose cone through the wind tunnel testing. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, it does. I have one more. Okay. Um, when you were modeling the CG of the rocket flight, are you counting, uh, does the CG move as you're expending propellant or? Uh, not, a, not at this point. Because when we implement attitude, we'd like to have that change in CP, so we have a change in inertial about the center of mass, or center of gravity of the rocket. Okay, I'm glad to see that you're keeping that in mind. My next question is for the structures team. And by the way, I'm glad to see that you all took into account the necessity of RF signals and we're limiting your use of carbon fiber as well. Uh, my question is on the nose cone. Uh, it's just, the nose cone just seems a little short to me. Is there a reason that that specific length is? Uh, yes, there is. So we, we looked at a few different fineness ratios for nose cones. Um, some of our research showed from older documents they suggested having a nose cone fineness ratio of closer to three. Um, however, we found during our simulations in open rocket that we achieved the greatest altitude using a fineness ratio of one to one. Uh, so we decided to go with that for right now until we can uh, create a better simulation and get better results. Okay. That's just something I would look into a little bit more as well. Um, next question is for uh, where you're modeling the uh, structure for the payload section. I know with the payload section they're accounting for having various sensors that will need to have external access to the rocket. Uh, when you're modeling the support structure and skin, are you taking into account the holes that are going to need to be in that part of the structure? Uh, at this time, no, we are not. Okay. Uh, 
for this season. I'd like to add something to that. We we don't need the we're because the this uh, set time is only about a minute, a small fraction of our time. The holes in the uh, exterior structure will not be necessary. That's why we're deploying the payloads. There will be holes in the payload structures, but not the rocket structure. Okay, I apologize. Uh, that, that wasn't clear to me. Okay, I understand that. Um, all right, next questions are from the payload team. Um, okay, so on slide. 79, you mentioned the radio set that you were using, and you also mentioned in slide 90, the range requirements for the radio must be about one kilometer. However, because the rocket is stated as being launched to at least 13 kilometers, do you think that it should be necessary to extend the range of your radio system, and if so, how do you think you should go about doing that? Yes, I believe it's necessary to extend that. Well, I do not have at this point a accurate range of where it will land, but yes, I believe it is probably going to be necessary to extend the range, and we plan on doing that through the antenna on the ground station. Now, this radio, is this going to be used to relay data, or is this simply just to recover the rocket, the payloads? Just to recover the rocket. Okay, so it's acting more of a beacon. Well, no, it's sending GPS data. Okay, I see what you're saying. I believe that concludes my questions. Thank you. Alright, good job guys. You also impressed when you shot today. So I think Jacob covered a lot of it. Let me just go through on slide 18. I think that was David. Your extra mass, I'm sorry. And is that coming for wires at all? Um what do you mean by wires? Because um you're going to be wiring all the components in your payload. Are you going to have any extra additional wires that can come in kind of that in your mass so budget? So wires right now is something that we have in model, on the PTO model we have uh, from well, most of all the components of structure. Wires is something that we do all this in. Although we might think it's, um, yeah, we, we don't know right now <laughs> how, mu how much the total wires weigh, but um, at least for the electronics, we do took into account the tethers that connect the payloads, so that must be taken into account. Okay. Just because our project, we put in a lot, we put a lot of stuff into a small mm -hmm. area, just like you guys are doing, and we also thought, you know, wires, no big deal, okay. but it adds up over time. So especially the wiring mass and like the volume of it, okay. try to consider that uh, later, or sorry, earlier rather than later. Okay. So for structures, uh, you guys probably mentioned this, um, when between the solid propulsion and Halo 2 payload, um, what material is that? Uh, so I'm sorry, which section are you referring to? All of it, because there's, I know there's foam, but what's the foam going to be in real life? Oh, uh, so the bulkheads here. All right, so the bulkheads will be composed of a fiberglass skin with interior also wood uh, ribs. Okay. If you could, I believe we have a slide showing. Could you show the one for the other section? Uh, there we go. Uh, back one, please. Sorry, forward two. Yes. Uh, so here you see the. Uh, Okay, which is located right here. Uh, and in this diagram over here, you can see the outside black circle, that would be fiberglass. Uh, the inside black circle uh, would also be fiberglass, and the rectangles would be the balsa wood, 
And as you can see in the 3D rendering, it will have a fiberglass skin on the top and bottom as well. And fiberglass, is there, um, will it be affected by melting temperature when the propulsion reaches that point, or will it, is it not there, sorry, is, is it going to melt when the propulsion reaches that? Uh, so we have not, we've not yet done a detailed thermal analysis at this time. However, uh, preliminary estimates suggest it will not melt. Uh, does that answer your question? It does, but uh, I think what kind of melt a little bit, so I'm going to look into that and make sure when you do your thermal analysis, make sure that it does not affect any of the panels either since there's not that much data to kind of make the comparison. So you definitely, since you are burning lots of stuff, try to uh, prioritize your temperature analysis. Yes, it will not work at, um, well, the GPS data won't uh, be, the GPS system won't be able to get data when it goes higher than 515 meters per second, I believe. So yes, there are certain issues with that. Also, if it's facing in the wrong direction, you won't be able to get any signal as well on the antenna. So, I don't know how prioritized that is, but that's definitely look into the nulls because you're not going to get any signal. Towards you or away from you, you're not going to get anything. Okay, we'll look at that. Okay. For um, slide 71, are you planning on validating these requirements? Um, are you guys planning on validating them in person or are you going to go with the data sheet? We're planning on validating, validating them for risk adjustment. Good, good. Are you, I don't know if this is you anymore. So for Clark Anderson, thank you, Jonathan. On slide 78, are you going to have any redundancies for looking at measuring the apparatus? Uh, we're going to pass it back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the uh, TL launchpad, which is the main sensor array, also has a barometric pressure sensor, which will be a our redundant system. Okay. Thank you again, Jonathan. Um, I'm not sure if this is you or not, but um, have you looked your instrumentation to make sure your instrumentation can withstand 315 newtons? That's the uh, slide 88. So at this time, we have a tentative plan to coat the electronics in a polymer substance of some type. Basically, uh, essentially making them into a brick. Uh, so it will withstand those forces. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, on slide 97, is the parachute tether going to be attached just at one point, or is it going to kind of go all the way around? Uh, around the Canopy? Yes. Uh, it goes, the tether goes up six inches uh, into the canopy, and there's also additional um, reinforcement around the canopy. Okay, so you're not worried about when that uh, force, when it uh, deploys, is going to turn the tether away from the parachute at all? No, and we looked at the opening force and we ran some calculations on that. But because we're a little preliminary still, we need to do further okay. testing. Just making sure that you guys would be able to work and all of a sudden it's something small that ends up screwing everything up. And then we also have a packing procedure for your parachute. Uh, that will come next semester. We'll be okay. practicing how to hold the parachute. And then, Lila on page one of our slide 107, I guess this is for you, Michelle, as well. Do you guys take into consideration any uh, factor of safety for the wheat? Actually, that will go back to Tosa. Uh, I believe currently our weight is a little overestimated, uh, but we have.
have actually not considered about their safety and um, we will do that. You know, it says it's really important. You don't burn anything out, then you might drop a little bit faster than you want to. Also, I know you guys don't have a lot of time, but if you do find yourself bored, kind of start looking at worst case scenarios. That way, if something does go wrong, you know, you can prepare for it as well. So, if like half of it burns, how fast will it drop? And then, also, well, now that I think about it, I don't know if you would be able to answer this, but if it doesn't reach half a lot, for some weird reason it malfunctions and you know it goes half the distance, will you deploy the parachute? Or just kind of like come back down? Yes, it will be able to. We are actually deploying the parachute based on the velocity. So yes, it will be able to deploy if it doesn't reach an expected altitude. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Sorry, I was trying to take notes. I'm sorry if I suddenly missed it. So, as of right now, I think that's everything that I have. I think Jacob has one more question, so thank you. I did have one more uh, comment. I just wanted to make it completely flat out of time. Uh, when you're setting your requirements, it's good engineering practice to keep in mind what the objective of your requirement is and then what the threshold of your design is. That's because although you can say with the engine you may need five kilonewtons of thrust, if that's your objective, that's great, but say something happens and you don't meet that, what is the threshold for performance if you can still complete the mission? Uh, that's done so that way, even if in practice you still can't meet the requirement, it still may pass the, uh, the design. It's just something to keep in mind in the future. Thank you. First comment. <clears throat> First comment is, I guess everybody got the memo that you dressed in black today. It's like the men in black. <laughs> uh, let's see. Overall, I thought it was a really good presentation. Um, I've been to lots and lots of design reviews for contractors for major programs for major subsystems. You know, the roof, you know, the dollars, and I tell you guys did a good job today. So, Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, one thing about the presentation, watch how fast you're speaking. Um, it's very easy to, when you're in a presentation in front of a lot of people, you get a little bit nervous. If you speak a little fast, it makes it a little harder to understand. So just concentrate on slowing down a little bit in your presentation. Um, just a couple of kind of big picture kind of questions. One of your requirements is this has to be reusable, essentially. You didn't say how many reusability attempts you'd like to get out of it. It seems like that would be kind of important. That would drive how much margin you have in your structure design uh, and those kinds of things. Right? Correct. Um, for our, when we had the um, request of proposal from Dr. B, um, we can consider this for how many we can for next semester, how many times it can be reusable. But for now, um, from the objectives, the goal was to make it as reusable as possible. We haven't actually got the threshold how many times yet, but we can consider that. Well, that kind of goes along with, with <clears throat> one of my other comments, and that is um, I, I didn't see a lot of. Well, they've got they may not any, I'm not sure. <clears throat> Actual structural testing of the vehicle, of the sections, of the skin, of the all the major components that are that are carrying the loads. It looked to me like everything was, was being verified by analysis. Is that did I miss something there? Uh, that is correct. As of now, we have not uh, done any uh, actual structural testing as we do not actually have the components which would be used to build the structure available. Uh, those would need to be purchased later. But is there a plan to do any kind of structural testing after? Uh, yes, definitely. I, did, I just didn't see that in the presentation. So. Okay. Um, particularly like the composite skins. Composites are famous for developing a little flaws in them that if you run through a structural test you'll find that thing just crumbles on you and it's not done exactly right. So those are the kinds of things that you would want to make sure that you test as opposed to just analyze. Um, question about the, if I 
I, if I understood the presentation correctly, you are not telemetry any data during flight. Is that correct? The only data that we are sending to a ground station is GPS data. Okay. So all of the payloads are, are recording their data? Yes. And you'll play it back once you get it back on the ground? That's correct. That is currently how the experimental space assist classes run with their payloads, right? Okay. And that, that justifies your not needing a very long uh, uh, your signal path as being about 15 kilometers or whatever. And this is kind of a, uh, a myth uh, in some ways that I don't think that you took into account and maybe it's negligible. The, the bolts that are sticking out that hold the fins to the vehicle as part of drag. Was that included at all in your drag coefficient? I don't know whether that maybe at this point in time is negligible, I don't know. But any kind of any looming protuberances typically on a rocket create um, drag obviously. So I didn't know whether that was included or not. Uh, so uh, at this time, we have not modeled the drag for the bolts. Uh, we're looking into a way to perhaps use more of a sort of flush rivets to replace those, but uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. And her last comment is along the line of one of the other comments. Um, in industry, I don't think you guys have the ability or the time or the wherewithal to do that kind of thing, but it's something I mention pretty much at any one of these that I go to. And that is one of the things that you need to think about when you're designing a rocket are potential failures and how you might mitigate a failure, especially when you're trying to build something that's reusable. Um, <clears throat> how you might mitigate those potential failures. It's called, in the industry, it's called an FMEA, a failure modes and effects analysis. And those kind of things can help you in the design by building a more robust design that can accommodate certain failures and still, still accomplish the mission. So that's something that you probably won't be able to do in this class, but it's something that you potentially want to do, certainly as you go into the industry. Thank you. I think that's all I have. Overall, like I said, a really good presentation. I think you guys did a great job. All right, now we got a a couple of minutes if the audience has any questions. Good morning. Uh, you guys did an excellent job. I can tell you guys put a lot of work into this project. Um, again, my name is Bryce Dance. I'm a junior. I have about eight years of high power rocket experience. I have just a couple questions uh, to you guys. Uh, the first is um, slide 14, your static stability margin appears to be, uh, oh, sorry, might be a little back further, um, uh, pressure and center of gravity. Is that after one point? Sorry. There we go, thank you. Um, so I noticed that your center of pressure and your center of gravity are different um, by about 10, 12 inches, 13 inches. Uh, is this prior to flight, uh, prior to motor burn, or after motor burn? Yes, the ones shown in the image is before motor burn, so initial states. Okay. And then, have you guys worked out your modeling yet for your center of gravity, how that shift happens after the motor burn, as well as your center of pressure shift through Mach 1? We have the center of gravity as it ends. It ends up being 16 centimeters apart from where it starts. Mm -hmm. um, no, don't think we model the center of pressure change. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, as you guys probably know, one of the things you want to make sure is your center of gravity is at least one diameter, about five or so inches ahead of uh, your center of pressure. Uh, rockets that go supersonic tend to have a problem where their center of pressure moves forward, making the rocket more unstable. Uh, it may be something to look at during the max velocity and make sure that your, st your stability is still there. Uh, rockets spinning around the sky don't tend to fly very straight or hit max altitude. Um, the, let's see, uh, the open rocket uh, simulation for your nose cone, um, one of the reasons you find a finest ratio of one to be most optimal is it uses the surface area of the, of the nose cone to find its drag. 
Uh, it's one of the downfalls to that program, unfortunately. Its drag coefficient, by the way, is extremely accurate, um, as modeled by thousands and thousands of rocket flights around the United States. Uh, I would suggest looking uh, toward other models, though, for your nose cone drag, as you guys put that into your own simulations in the MATLAB programs. It's just a quirk of the program. It likes to just look at your nose cone um, uh, surface area for its drag. That's why you'll find conical sections to be a little bit more efficient, even though Von Kahn and our hack series may be more appropriate for your mock play. Um, budget, uh, toward the end of $2,600, is that um, including the hardware cost for the vehicle, or is it $1,000 uh, per flight? Is that in addition to the $2,600? The $1,000 is for the, when the experimental space systems class implements our project, that's how much it will be costing for that. Okay, so the 2600 is all vehicle design yes, this and is not for, including the first flight. Yeah, this is, this is our, for our cost for development. Okay, yes. perfect. Um, let's see, I think that covers most of it. Um, oh, a really important one. You're uh, deploying only a single parachute, bringing yourself down at about 25 feet per second. One of the big problems with flying really high is you may leave your waiver zone, uh, particularly in Tripoli Phoenix. You have a, a, it's a three mile radius of landing zone. If there's any chance uh, to start building that into your trajectory analysis, uh, it is illegal to leave that waiver. So uh, you need to make sure that you land within that zone. Commonly in rockets, we'll deploy a small parachute at Apogee, bring the rocket down at 50 to 100 feet per second, and then deploy the main parachute at about 1,000 to 1,500 feet. Uh, again, just something that isn't taken into account yet, it seems like, in the trajectory analysis, but it's something to look into in the path in the future, as well as your launch system. So how are you providing the vertical stability for the first you know, 10 to 15 feet of flight before you build up enough speed? Uh, it doesn't seem like you guys are going to be designing that in a way. How are you planning on actually putting the vehicle vertical and launching it? So currently, we believe that uh, the Tripoli Rocketry Association Phoenix Prefecture will have a launch vehicle for us. A, la a launch pad. A launch pad, yes. Sir. Okay, perfect. So uh, one of the things you may want to know, uh, uh, since I've flown there many times, they don't have any club on the equipment. It's all personal on. You, know, so you have to talk to you know Joe, who's going to bring his pad, who might be big enough or might not be big enough for your particular system, especially on the largest commercial motor ever made. Um, on the market right now, so you want to make sure that as soon ahead of time as possible, you get in contact with somebody there, make sure that their system meets your requirements and that your system meets their requirements for that system, because uh, that will be very important to show up and have, have something to figure out. Thank you, Bryce. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think that covers everything. Thank you guys, excellent job. I look forward to uh, some pictures and video from your launch next semester. Thanks, Bryce. I'm Dr. Dr. Yale. Uh, and again, I'll echo what everybody else has said. It's, uh, you've obviously put in a lot of work, a lot of nice, nice uh, effort there, but uh, maybe I'll point out a couple of things you haven't looked at. Uh, how are you attaching the nose cone? Is it just sitting up there? Uh, so for the nose cone, uh, it, it's a little difficult to see in this picture. However, uh, there will be a ring uh, beneath the the nose cone here that will insert into the top of the payload section. Uh, it'll basically fit like a glove and that should be enough to stabilize it during flight. Okay. Um, if we go to slide number four, well, let's see. Yeah, this, this is the one. Uh, are you manufacturing this thing or are you building it? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, purchasing. So for the nose cone, our current plan is to have a, a slightly smaller version of this nose cone, 3D printed, and then lay up the fiberglass on top of it and manufacture it ourselves. Okay, so you'll 3D print a jig and then lay the fiberglass up on it. it looks like the thickness on this is pretty small. Yeah, it's it, less than two, two hundredths of a, of a centimeter. Are you going to be able to fabricate that? Uh, yes, we should be able to fabricate it. However, this is not accounting for the thickness that will be added from the resin. Okay. I, I don't know. There's just a lot of precision in the numbers there that I'm not sure that 
uh, particularly, I mean, even with your 3D printing, are you going to be able to 3D print something that's going to be 6.379 oh, centimeters uh, in diameter? No, we won't, but that will not be an issue as the thickness of the 3D printed nose cone will not affect the thickness of the fiberglass laid up on the surface. Well, it, it's going to define what the inside diameter of, the, of your fiberglass nose cone is, then. Uh, it will define the inside diameter, yes. Which is going to be pretty important in terms of mating up with the structure that the nose cone is supposed to slip on the, on the outside of this, this Structure uh, tab. The part of the nose cone will be laying up on the 3D printed, uh, the fiberglass portion will be laying up on the 3D printed nose cone, uh, will not include the ring, which is the portion which must uh, slip into the structure. That will be manufactured separately. But it's also made out of fiberglass. That's correct. Okay, maybe we need to talk, talk offline. I, I, I'm just concerned about the the level of precision that you'll be able to actually actually do and then have, have this all uh, fit together correctly. All right. Um, is the nose cone itself recoverable? Is uh, it tethered to your rocket somehow? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, there's going to be a plate on the base of the nose cone and attached to this plate. We will have a small tether which will uh, Essentially, just let the nose cone hang off the side of the structure after it is ejected. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to the $1,000 recurring cost. Uh, I was assuming that was largely for motor. Correct. What you just told me was it was for payloads. Oh, no. For the entire implementation of the project itself, um, for the rocket, the, the motor for the, fir the first initial cost of it, would be twelve hundred dollars, and I believe it's nine hundred fifty dollars for the reload, and the rest of so Dr. B, uh, Dr. Benavides, and Dr. Martin will be building the entire structure in the summer before school starts, and so the cost of the entire uh, project for the students will be costing a thousand dollars. They're building what? The structure for the for the rocket or the. The casing for the motor. The casing will be commercially available, so that will be bought. That will be, I'm sorry, that will be mainly for our budget for. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, Dr. Young. So when you buy the motor, it comes it as a casing and a motor refill, so it's twelve hundred dollars. And then to replace just the motor itself, it's another nine hundred fifty dollars, as she was saying. So the initial cost is twelve hundred. To replace the motor is nine hundred fifty. The electronic sp space systems class will have all of the components and everything that we've already purchased. So they, all they have to do is put together some foam or fiberglass or you know whatever structures that they want to put together to put inside the rocket. And, and that's what Doctor B and, and Doctor Mark are building over the summer. I have no idea what Dr. B and Dr. Mark are building on the site. I, 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 I was surprised that they'd be building I'm sorry. anything. The, what our goal is for the experimental space systems class, that the structure will be ready for the experimental space systems class, and their goal is to build the, like, build the inside payloads. That's what their objective of the class is for the experimental space systems class. Okay, you, you as a team are responsible for building those six payloads. Correct. I mean, for this project, and then we will be constructing uh, the, sorry. Yes, we will be responsible for building the structure of the payloads. The primary method of analysis in the experimental space system students class will be to test all of the instrumentation and make sure it functions properly. Okay, thank you. Um, again, just trying to think of things that can go wrong. What's the battery life on your in particular, your recovery system, uh, because a lot of times you have to turn these things on well before you actually launch. It's sitting there on the pad while you're doing final checkout and stuff, and uh, you'd, you'd hate for that to be a, 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 an issue then after you launch. That is a major concern of ours, and we'll make sure that it lasts far longer than it needs to in physical testing. Okay. Uh, same thing is true not only, uh, I mean, you, you specify that your tethers are, are strong enough to survive opening shock, but uh, uh, you've got these four points from the canopy that come down. 
presumably there's one point that then uh, is the tether into the payload. So what's the interface there? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? From the canopy, you've got four lines coming down that come together in a common point. Yes. Uh, beyond that, there's a single tether that's coming down that has your, your payload stack and then your your rocket. What's the interface between those four lines and the one line? Between those four lines, they're connected into one nylon cord, which is wrapped in Kevlar, and then there's a carabiner at the bottom of that, which is attached to the nylon cord for the payloads. Okay, has anybody looked at the strength of the carabiner? At this time, we don't have the specific, the specifications of the carabiner. Okay. Um, when we purchase the parachute, we will all right. and, and the reason why I bring this up is because, based on my experience, I've seen this happen before, too, with students. And everything's wrong enough except for that. And then you've got a parachute that's coming down, and you have a rocket that's coming down. And they're not together. And, and it wasn't because the ropes broke. It was because the interface between, the, between that did. I, I think that's all that I have. Is there somebody else? So I have one quick question. Um, have you guys taken into account a ground station at all? The current design for ground station is a laptop with another of the same radio attached to it. That's all I had.